Today on People Now, Dog the Bounty Hunter emotionally reveals his wife Beth Chapman's last words before her death. Kim K defending the name of her new shapewear line after accusations of cultural appropriation. Oh no, another Bachelorette bombshell involving Jed from the current season of the show. Yeah. Don't care at all. Don't care about your career. <laughs> Ophelia star and huge Harry Potter fan Daisy Ridley telling us how she tried to play it cool with her co-star, <laughs> former Pottercast member Tom Felton. And actor Alan Cumming is here with everything we can expect in season two of his hit CBS show, Instinct. It's all live today on People Now. Let's go. Hey guys, happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to People Now. Happy we made it. Weekend is here. The force is strong with Daisy Ridley. The actress is going to be filling us in on what to expect from Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, a little later in the show. It was so much fun to get to kind of talk to her and, and about being on set and everything that she went on. She was awesome. She's really cool. So for today's question of the day, we want to know which character are you most excited to see return in the new Star Wars movie? Is it Rey, Kylo Ren, Ghost, Luke Skywalker, or General Leia? Vote in our People poll or tweet us your answer with the hashtag people now. We're gonna check in on those results in a little bit, but for now, here's what you need to know and what's trending today, starting on a sad note. Dog the Bounty Hunter is continuing to mourn the loss of his wife, Beth Chapman. The reality star, whose real name is Dwayne Chapman, told local reporters in Hawaii that Beth's last words weren't about herself, but rather her family. He opened up about the emotional day, tearfully recalling, quote, when she had an attack, I didn't know anything to do but to say in Jesus' name and hold her. And when I said in Jesus' name, she said, say it again, say it more. And then she told the girls and everybody, I love you and are you guys all okay? Don't worry. That was his quote. And Beth's death from stage two throat cancer came just days after she was admitted to Hawaii's Queens Medical Center on June 22nd. As for how the Chapmans are coping, Duane told the news outlet, quote, you kind of try to remember that you're celebrating life, but right now we're mourning the death, so it's not good. Though she's no longer here, Duane jokes that Beth is still controlling him from heaven through the sweet notes that she would leave around the house for him. When remembering his wife, he recalls her strength, saying Beth fought every step of the way and insisted on beating cancer until the very end. He said this, quote, she did it her way. There's some things that they predicted that the doctors ended up saying, we've never ever seen anything like this. Her way was to live. She wanted to live so bad and she fought so long. And the reason she fought, she liked life, but she wanted to show people how to beat it and what to do when it got her. Despite Beth's determination, Dwayne said he knew the day would eventually come, but not as soon as it did. He says, it came very unexpected, really fast. All of her clothes were exactly where they were, her makeup, everything, we didn't prepare. He added, it's just incredible when you walk alone in the bedroom and you're there and she was there two days ago. Really heartbreaking. As Dwayne continues to cope, he is looking to his faith and celebrating all the good times they shared. On Thursday, one day after her passing from stage two throat cancer, the reality star tweeted a video of Beth dancing and singing along to Bruno Mars's song Perm. Take a look at this. Yeah, really, obviously, now as they look back, a sad memory, but a fun memory as well. Yeah, and Dwayne told reporters that the last step to dying is accepting it, and that Beth had just told him the other day, honey, the last step I ain't taking. The Chapmans publicly announced Beth's cancer diagnosis in September of 2017. Even back then, Beth maintained a positive attitude. In November of 2017, she told people, quote, I had to keep moving every day, moving forward. That's all you can do when you get a diagnosis like this. So I take it each day at a time, and I'll fight it with all that I have. Have. Beth Chapman died on Wednesday at the age of 51. 
All right, guys, we move on to this. Allison Williams and her husband, Ricky Van Veen, have separated after nearly four years of marriage. The couple announced their split on Thursday through a joint statement obtained by People. That statement read, with mutual love and respect, we have made the decision to separate as a couple. Van Veen is the co-founder of College Humor, and as you may know, Williams, from her role as Marnie on the HBO series Girls. The two met through mutual friends and dated for more than three years before they became engaged in February of 2014. They tied the knot in September 2015 in Wyoming, and of course, Williams' Girls co co-stars were on the scene, Lena Dunham, Jemima Kirk. Other guests included Katy Perry and John Mayer, Bruce Springsteen and Seth Meyers. At the time, a source told people that Tom Hanks officiated and Williams' father, former NBC Nightly News anchor Brian Williams, walked her down the aisle. The source said that the pair's nuptials were stunning. Their joint statement about the split continued. We are grateful for the friendship that we have and will continue to have. We wish them all the best moving forward. Kim Kardashian West standing by the name of her new shapewear line. It's called Kimono. Kim revealed the name of her shapewear line on Tuesday and has faced accusations that she is culturally appropriating the name and misrepresenting the traditional Japanese garment. Some people also found Kim's company name disrespectful as she used the word kimono with images of women in their undergarments. So there are some of the photos there. Kim released a statement to the New York Times addressing the accusations saying, quote, I made the decision to name my company kimono, not to disassociate the word from its Japanese roots, but as a nod to the beauty and detail that goes into a garment. She goes on to add, I understand and have deep respect for the significance of the kimono in Japanese culture. My solution wear brand is built with inclusivity and diversity at its core, and I'm incredibly proud of what's to come. She also made a point to clarify that by her trademarking the name, it does not preclude or restrict anyone in this instance from making kimonos or using the word kimono in reference to the traditional garments. Now, as of Thursday morning, hashtag Kim Ono was circulating on Twitter <laughs> and a petition on change.org calling the name horrible cultural disrespect had over 11,000 signatures. And this isn't the first time Kim has faced cultural appropriation backlash. At Kanye's Sunday service at Coachella in April, she wore a head pendant that is a traditional Indian wedding adornment. She's also worn what she called Beau Derek braids. People get very upset about Here's her. Here's the thing. She has had this type of backlash before. She kind of walked right into this one, right? Kimono? It's, it's yeah. already a thing. I don't... It's, it's kind of confusing. It's, as specific as they are, and they think through what they're going to do in terms of PR and everything also else. Also having a big team behind her. I'm, I'm shocked. Coming. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's very strange. Kim's collection is set to be released in July and will include bras, bodysuits, briefs, and shorts. Khloe Kardashian celebrated her 35th birthday with an all pink extravaganza Thursday night. The intimate yet elaborate celebration welcomed guests with a pink neon sign that read, Clo Money. <laughs> the decor included some of Chloe's most hilarious quotes on pink cups. Guests were also treated to pink donuts, cake, other sweet treats as well. Sounds like fun. Yeah, Chloe stuck to the color scheme by wearing a pink strapless top while her daughter True wore a light pink dress. And of course, her famous family was in attendance, including pal Scott Disick and his girlfriend, Sophia Ritchie. And she's recently been snapped partying with Chloe's sisters, Kylie and Kendall, who of course were also in attendance. Scott is, of course, Courtney's ex, and I think it's really great that Sophia gets along with the family. They're, they're welcoming her in here. Yeah, Scott and Courtney are co-parenting seemingly well. Scott recently said kind words about Chloe too, said that there's no one alive good enough to date her. I love their friendship. They seem to be making it work in a very cordial way, so that's good. Yeah. One person not in attendance, though, at Chloe's birthday bash was her ex, Tristan Thompson. He did post a sweet and unexpected birthday tribute to Chloe. This was surprising. He said, you are the most beautiful human I've ever met inside and out. Thank you for being an amazing mommy to our Princess True. She's blessed to have someone like you to look up to. I wish you nothing but more success and send you positive blessings your way. Enjoy your day, Coco. So a source tells people Chloe did see Tristan's post, but quote, didn't really get why he posted it. The source adds they have a child together, but are not together. Yeah, his to public, his public <laughs> words of affection also raised some eyebrows among her famous family. The source says her family thinks he posted it because he wants to make himself look good. Tristan and Chloe co-parent True, but that's it. And we saw part of his February cheating scandal with Jordan Woods, a former friend of the fam, play out on Keeping Up the Kardashians on Sunday. So more of that this coming Sunday. It is surprising that he posted. I don't know. I think he's, it's like, it's just a nice gesture. That, and I think their reaction's fine too. Whatever. Yeah? Yeah. Wait, but, but is he texting her happy birthday as well? Or is he just posting? That's the Is it all PR thing? Is yeah. That the okay, maybe. We'll probably never know. Debate it in the comments, everybody. Here we go. <laughs> we have another Bachelorette bombshell for you today. In a new episode of the Reality Steve podcast re released on Thursday, Jed Wyatt's ex-girlfriend, Haley Stevens, finds out that other women have come forward claiming that they had been with Jed too just before he went on 
on The Bachelorette. Oh, this is painful. You guys might remember, Haley spoke up exclusively to people last week about allegedly being in a relationship with Jed when he left to be on the show. They'd just taken a romantic trip together, just said, I love you. She said she was devastated watching him fall for Hannah on the show. Well, Reality Steve was discussing messages that Haley received in support of her decision to speak up when he then revealed that he had one woman reach out to him supposedly about her own very similar experience with Jed. All piling up. Steve said this, quote, she showed me everything. This was, I believe, 10 days before you left for the Bahamas with Jed. He slept with another woman. I have the text messages to prove it. And you didn't find out about this until a week ago when she came forward to you. Uh, that was his quote as he was talking on his podcast. Yeah, Haley explained that she had not been aware of any actual cheating before the podcast taped, and she began to cry after finding out about the alleged affair. Reality Steve spoke to Us Weekly about those messages, saying, quote, I've seen the text messages. They are clear as day as to what happened, and I've spoken to her numerous times myself. I believe her story. She shared a lot. She had no idea about Haley or the show. Jed never brought either of those things up. Yeah, and like we said, Haley had opened up to people exclusively about her relationship with Jed. The most crushing thing was she never heard from him when he got back. He completely ghosted her. She explained that she wasn't too worried at first that he would fall in love on the show because he kept saying that he, quote, only did it for his career. We remember Jed admitted in his one-on-one -on -one with Hannah B that he originally came on the show for the platform, but he had begun to actually fall in love for her or with her. That's what he said. And also, this is all from her story. It's all allegedly more information's coming out. There's always two sides of the story. If Jed wants to continue his music career, I think he needs a, like a publicist to kind of start managing some of this because this is interesting. It's not uh, looking good for not looking him. Good. <laughs> All right, we'll keep you posted on that and keep tabs because we love everything Bachelor and Bachelorette, mm -hmm. especially the drama. Stay with us. Everything we know so far about Harry and Meghan's first royal tour as a family and baby Archie's christening. Plus, actor Alan Cumming will be live on our couch talking Instinct season two and so much more. Stick around for that. All right, we're just minutes away from filling you in on everything Daisy Ridley had to say about Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. We've been asking you, which character are you most excited to see return in our People poll? So let's take a look. Who's got the lead here? I think I might, oh, Ray. Yeah. yeah. All right, that makes sense. <laughs> it does. Kylo Ren, yeah, that makes sense. All yeah, right. We have some write-in votes too. Rose and Tyler say Finn. Tyler and Julian say Lando. Aaron says Luke and his dad Anakin together as Force Ghost, please. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So lots of ideas there. Keep voting, keep weighing in. But for now, we move on to this. Watch. And how did you meet Rob Kardashian? Uh, through social media. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, we met, but we didn't really meet meet. So like we had, like he had hit me up on like Instagram and I was like, this is like fishy. I ain't trust it. Cause I thought I was like trying to get set up or something. I uh -huh. don't know. Uh -huh. And then I was like, you know what? Like, let me go and like, just talk to him and see what he's about. Yeah. So then that's how we kind of like got hooked up. Yeah. And nice guy. Wow, meeting through the DMs. <laughs> it happens, you guys. Black China is opening up about where she stands with her ex-fiance and father of her daughter Dream, Rob Kardashian. On Thursday's episode of The Rule Paul Show, the mother of two got candid about everything from how the two met to how co-parenting is going. I love RuPaul's reaction. Just yeah. like, okay, okay. <laughs> China and Kardashian, who called off their engagement in February of 2017, agreed to joint custody in September of that year following a whirlwind failed romance. Both of them even alleged abuse in separate lawsuits. And China's latest comments about her ex come over a week after she called out, quote, the hypocrisy of their insistence that Dream appear on the Keeping Up with the Kardashians reality show. China calls the show stale and contrived. Ouch. Wow. Well, some shade. Speaking out against the Kardashians. Kardashian and his lawyer reportedly, reportedly informed China in a letter that Dream could not appear on her upcoming docuseries without Kardashian's prior consent. This is according to TMZ. Despite all the drama, China claims on RuPaul that co-parenting with Rob is actually going really well. Why Watch this. I mean, co-parenting is good with both of my baby fathers. We have a mutual agreement and everything runs smoothly. So yeah. it's like no animosity in the air. Everything's like good. Yeah. We're in all in a good place. Guys, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have officially announced an upcoming royal tour of Africa. We have so many questions. When, where will baby Archie be along for the ride? Here with all the answers is our royal correspondent, Imogen Lloyd Webber. All the answers. Yeah, we good to see you. We know you have them. Let's I'll start try. with this, though. All right, Under so pressure. Harry and Meghan going to Africa. Will baby Archie be there? 
probably. Um, <laughs> they hinted he will, saying on Instagram this will be their first official tour as a family. They will visit South Africa. Harry is also making stops in Malawi, Angola and Botswana. He's looking to raise awareness for the high impact work local communities are doing across the Commonwealth and beyond. Uh, in Malawi, Harry plans to expand the reach of Centre Bali, which he founded in 2006, right. which um, helps young people affected by HIV and AIDS in Lesotho, Botswana and Malawi. And of course, Angola is where Diana visited back in 1997 and famously walked through that uh, field of landmines. Mm -hmm. so, lots of meaning. Lots of meaning. And we know Africa means so much yeah. to Harry, now also to Meghan. Mm -hmm. So why is their connection to the continent so strong? Well, we all know about the special place in Harry's heart. I think since he was a boy, he's loved going to see Africa. Um, Harry and Meghan have traveled there several times. They visited Botswana early in their relationship Third date, people. Third date <laughs> in the summer of 2016. And again to celebrate Meghan's 36th birthday in 2017. It's also where the diamond and her engagement ring is sourced. I think that's uh, when we knew they were very, very serious. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't Third it? Third like, date, yeah. Taking, taking, trips. Trips. Taking, the, taking trips to Africa together. Yeah. This news came the same day a post on the Sussex Royal Instagram mm -hmm. revealed that Harry made a surprise appearance to co-host a fundraising event for National Geographic. So tell us about this and how does it tie into Africa? So he's shining a light on the millions of people and animals in Africa whose water source is at risk. And there's a National Geographic's document into the Okavango, which is uh, what the launch was for this. The film details the vulnerability of the Okavango Delta and source rivers in Angola, which are the primary water source for a million people as well as the world's largest remaining elephant population. And it turns out Harry has big plans for the weekend. Huh. Might mirror what some of us are going to be doing this weekend. He's off to a baseball game. Yeah, he's spending Saturday at London's former Olympic Stadium for the first ever regular season MLB game played in Europe. New York Yankees versus Boston Red Sox. Yeah, that's right, Jeremy. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Harry's not a stranger to baseball, actually. Um, cue the, uh, the throwback. Yeah, we've got a little photo yeah, here. Yeah. Nine oh, years video, ago, yeah. Harry visited New York City and threw an honorary first pitch at a Mets game in honor of UK Armed Forces Day. Looks like it was a good pitch, too. You, uh, <laughs> sporty, though, Harry. He's it's always been good at this. You did the first pitch. Once. I did, so I have something in common with you Harry guys here. Are the same person. Uh, <laughs> before we move on, we've heard rumblings that Harry and Meghan are going to christen baby Archie in July. Do we know any details? Tell us about that. How's it all going to play okay, out? Okay, so we think Archie will be baptized at St. George's Chapel, Windsor, which of course is where Meghan and Harry got married. Um, if you think about William and Kate's children, they all got uh, baptized at the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace right. in London. So different venue there. Queen Elizabeth apparently won't make it. She also missed Louise. This is not a snub. She's a busy woman. She's a queen. Um, but expect <laughs> senior royals, including William and Kate, um, Charles and Camilla. But it'll be small and intimate like the Cambridges. I mean, they're only sort of, I think, 22 at Louise christening, maybe? Okay. So yeah, they're very small intimate occasions. Um, Archie will wear the same christening gown um, as as Louis and the Cambridges did. Right, there's always a lot to Yeah, do absolutely. About the, the um, it's a private family occasion, but also a moment of historic significance. So they usually use water from the River Jordan, as you do. Um, the godparents are always very interesting. It's a glimpse into the trusted inner circle of the royals. And so how many there end up being and yeah. all that, right? Yeah. Media access, of course, will be very carefully managed. Yeah. But we'll be looking on that. And you'll have the scoop, I'm account. sure. Yeah. I will um, do my best. Also want to talk about this. So Prince yeah. William made headlines this week for saying it would be absolutely fine mm -hmm. by him if one of his kids, George, Charlotte, or Louis came out to him as gay. This is not surprising because he's supported the LGBTQ community for years, but still a big deal to make this claim. So first, break down what he said about yeah, this. Yeah, so he said he and Kate have talked about the possibility and how they'd give their children the best support they could, especially considering their role in the public eye. William said, it worries me not because of them being gay, it worries me as to how everyone else will react and perceive it, and then the pressure is then on them. And as you say, William has previously supported the LGBTQ community. He posed on the cover of Attitude in June 2016. It's one of those things where typically the royals don't make political statements, yeah. right? They don't, when it comes to voting, when it comes mm. to sort of weighing in one way or another. William here seems to be, in some ways, going a step further and making a kind of a clear statement. Is that a unique they thing? They do and they don't. If you think back to Prince Charles, who's been talking about issues in inner cities, organic farming, urban planning for years and years and years. And of course, Princess Diana was very outspoken certainly on um, HIV and AIDS, landmines. So on so many levels, William is just following in his parents' footsteps. All right, that makes now, sense. Now, obviously, when Charles becomes king, he's going to have to pull back um, on those opinions because the monarch really has to be above politics. And when William is King William V, he's also going to have to pull back. But at the moment, I think he's just following in his parents' footsteps. Makes sense. All right. Speaking of the royal kids, came yeah. to be with one of Prince George and Princess Charlotte's favorite outdoor hobbies yes. this week. So could we have two photographers in the making here? Let's oh, talk about this. Apparently. <laughs> So Kate revealed that George and Charlotte loved getting outside with a camera. Kate, of course, has become a celebrated amateur photographer, mainly for taking iconic images of her own children in recent years. And she joined a workshop for young people around the UK for photography this week. Yeah. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, after 67 years this week, passed over to Kate, her long-standing patronage of the Royal Photographic Society, which is quite a big deal. We'll All be right. watching for the yes. photos. Well, Imogen, thank you so much as always. Good to see you both.
Actress Daisy Ridley stars in Ophelia, a modern twist on Shakespeare's Hamlet, alongside celebs like Clive Owen and Naomi Watts. And there's also Harry Potter star Tom Felton, aka Draco Malfoy, who plays Ophelia's brother, Laertes, in the film. And if you didn't know, Daisy is a major Harry Potter fan. <laughs> she's met almost every cast member from the franchise, and she still gets pretty starstruck. Watch. I tried to do the professional thing. Yeah. Like, I've worked with, obviously, some really cool people. And I just tend to do tunnel vision, which probably makes me more, weirdly more antisocial because I don't want to ask things to bug people. So I'm like, yeah. Don't care at all. Don't care about your career. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, big fan. But I mainly tried to get his diet better because he eats a lot of chips and drinks a lot of Coca-Cola. Mm. I was like, dude, man, you've got to take better care of yourself. <laughs> But um, it was so great, and he's great in it. It was fun. We were playing brother and sister. Do you think he's listening to not eating as many chips? And no, no. <laughs> Maybe actually, I saw a picture of him, and he looked pretty healthy. <gasps> Maybe like, you yes. are the reason, and he's kind of yes. turning around. I love that she's looking out. Uh, <laughs> while Daisy fangirls over one famous franchise, she's also a major star in another. You may have heard of Star Wars. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker comes out later this year, but Daisy got a sneak peek from director J.J. Abrams. Yeah, talk about a big perk there. So what does Ray think of the latest installment? It's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like, It's weird because I think uh, a lot of the time you're like, oh. And with this one, I think I feel, you know, I'm more comfortable and I feel a bit more confident. And there is literally nothing else I could have done. Like, It's, I think, the most output I could have given physically, emotionally, all of it. So I feel really excited about it. Daisy is also opening up about what it was like not having the late Carrie Fisher on set this time around. Fisher, of course, died in December of 2016. But Daisy says that everything surprisingly came together really well, and she thinks that Carrie's friends, family, and fans will be very happy with how it all turned out. Take a look. The nice thing is there are sort of the videos of um, behind the scenes of episode seven. There are like bits of me and her dancing, and so it's nice to sort of have that. But yeah, it's very emotional. I do think that fans and I, I believe her family, because Billy's in this one, her daughter, um, and her brother, I believe they're very happy with what's happened with her story. And it's just strange, like the stuff that we filmed, it just fits. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's eerie. I think it should be a good tribute. It was just great doing it. So I sort of hope that people leave feeling like we did when we were making it. Can't wait to see how all that plays out. In yeah, that very new excited. Movie. We'll have more from our sit down with Daisy Ridley on the show next week. In the meantime, you can check her uh, new film, Ophelia, out. It's in theaters right now. Looks like an inside job. This is where you say you were right because you're always right because you're Dr. Dylan Reinhardt. Hello. Only a sadistic killer would trap a woman in her own cryo chamber so she freezes to death. But sadistic killers like to watch their terrified victims' reactions. It arouses them, makes them feel godlike. This murderer couldn't see her die. Ooh, intense. Instinct is back for season two. We are so excited to be joined now by the star of the series, Alan Cumming. He's here to break down what we, t we can expect and so much more. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. you I too. love yeah. you watching you. Those are some intense lines. Laughing my head off. They're great one-liners to just like pull out of parties, I think, right? <laughs> I know. They're like I fully just, into character. I always say to people, uh, you know, our show is not a sort of a gritty, realistic drama. The first person to die dies in her own cryogenic chamber. <laughs> and then the next person to die is drowned in his own Olympic swimming pool. There you go. So <laughs> it's, who knows what's going to happen? So we do know more kind of creepy murder mysteries and that type of thing. What are you most excited for people to see, though, other than that coming up? I think the tone of the second season is much better. Like the first season, everyone was so tense and stressed out because it's the first time there was a, a gay you know, a leading character in a, in a network drama. So, you know, you don't get many gay people in cop shows. And everyone was a bit like, what's going to happen, you know? So everyone was a little tense. And then when it came out, everyone, they realized that the, the things that they were worried about were actually the things that people liked most about it, the things that made it different. So in the second season, everyone took, kind of chilled out a bit more. And I think the tone of it's a little more on, on, on the nose. Yeah. yeah, and you've said in other interviews that in the second season, your character won't have a gun at all. Yeah. Why was that so important to you? I just don't like using, a, I don't have a gun in my life. I've never had a gun. I don't, and, I, and I, I, I'm aware I'm in a cop show, so you have <laughs> guns, but I just felt like, you know, I don't need to have a gun. I, I could, my character, I could just, I think one less person wielding a gun on television can only be a positive thing, that people don't just assume that everyone everywhere has guns all the time in this country, and it's, you know, there's a, such a 
problem with gun violence here that anything that I can do to change that message, I, I'll, I'll do. And you really took a stand for that, yeah. Well, I just, I just, I just, I never, every, there's, there's loads of scenes where other actors are, you know, I've got their guns out and I just walk into the room without a gun. Yeah. Like I've got yeah. a sort of a shield around me, an impermeable shield. Yeah, how did that change your storyline or maybe the way that you approached the character? Well, it didn't at all. I mean, I just, I just didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell them until after we were finished. I, I don't know if you realize, but for the entire season, I've not used a gun. Yeah. And nobody noticed. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that your character is the first openly gay character in a, a, an American drama. Network, uh, drama. network drama, network drama specifically. So that's an interesting distinction. As you mentioned, it's one of many factors about this guy. Um, but elaborate a little more on what it meant to you to kind of bring that to fruition and, and kind of have that place as the first. Well, it was a great honor, you know, and I was one of the reasons why I wanted to do it, just because I felt like finally this is happening. Finally, it, it, it seemed crazy to me in 2018 is the first time that there was a gay leading character in a network drama. But also I feel what's m more important is like how, how that story is told. And what I like is that, and what I think is important to go through, uh, to keep happening on television and films, is that we have these characters, they're doing something in the story, and they just happen to be mm -hmm. gay or whatever they are. That that's not the main thrust of their narrative. And I think I get really pissed off, I'm bored, when people say gay actor Alan Cumming, queer actor Alan Cumming. Fair enough, all those things are true. but. You wouldn't say straight actor, blah, blah, right. or heterosexual yeah. actor. Actor. Yes. Great and actor. So that's what you know, you've got yeah. to, you look at it like that. You have to like, we have to get to the point where we just tell stories about people. And one of the facets of them is that they're LGBTQ or whatever. Sure. So it's, 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 it's about how you, you d sort of desensationalize uh, someone's sexuality. By the way, you mentioned that, and your shirt uh, plays right in. You've got a, this yes. shirt has a special meaning when you it comes see, to the LGBTQ community. This is Martha P. Johnson, and she was a trans woman of color, one of the first people to throw a brick at the Stonewall riots. And she kind of was very instrumental in, and I think what people don't know is that actually trans, trans women of color were very important in the start of this, what has become, you know, the, the, uh, the um, gay rights struggle. So right. yeah. I'm, I'm wearing this t-shirt, and if you, if you, but it's called T Rex NYC on Instagram, and half the money goes to the Hedrick Martin School, which helps LGBT LGBTQ youth. Phew! Yeah. Right. But I got it out. Yeah, we want to talk it. a little bit more about <laughs> Pride in a few minutes. However, I want to say congrats on the new series, Briar Patch, that oh, you're yes. joining. That's very exciting. It's a story about an investigator trying to figure out who murdered her sister. Yes. Your character is described as elegant, charming, and murderous. Yes. How much do you love playing the villain? I a love murderous it. villain. I love, I love this. I, it's so great. I've not started filming yet. I go next week. But it's so good. Like the, there's a scene. Like I got sent two of the scripts to look at, and the second one, there's a scene that's just so great. Um, just how he, and he's also very dapper as well. I mean, it's a bit like Dylan in that he dresses well, but in a different sort of way. He's more kind of vulpine and scary. Obviously, yeah. he kills people. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's scary. Very <laughs> scary. You're going to be working with Rosario Dawson. Yeah, have you already worked together? We that's did a movie a thousand years ago called Josie and the Pussycats, when da uh, uh, um, when Rosario was like. Um, I don't know, about 20 or something. That's a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Great, yeah. yeah. I was like the oldest person on that film. Then I was like <laughs> 35 or something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I'm, I love Rosario. She's such a nice girl. And Rosario is is reportedly dating Cory Booker, who I just had me. the big debate, uh, the Democratic debate. Um, is that something that the two of you will talk a lot about, do you suspect, as you work together? And I would think we're both very active politically and socially, and so I'm sure we'll have a good old chit chat about that. But I, I know, I think that's lovely. I, I, like, I love she's got uh, a nice lefty boyfriend. Yeah, do you, I mean, do you, I, I almost, I picture you like getting into her ear to get into his ear about things that are going on. Is that something you'll do? I don't think I need to, that sounds weird actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into Cody Booker's ear. Okay, all right, all right. to be clear. Or his pants or anything. <laughs> You can do him. Um, let's talk about your bar, Club Coming. Yes. I've been there. Oh, you have? I've never been, yeah. Yeah, I love it. No, you gotta go. It's really fun. Yeah, I love it's, it. It's great fun. Um, you just had this dinner to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. Yeah. Yeah, who was there? What was the vibe? Oh, it was crazy. Well, it's a tiny bar, and uh, they had all this, you know, they put these tables and all the posh glasses. There we are. It looked, it looked like, um, I've never seen it look so swanky. But I had a really, there's Juliana, and there's Katie Couric and Michael Stipe and Justin Theroux. And uh, who else was there? Oh, Jake Shears from the Scissor Sisters. And um, hoping there's more pictures there. Uh, oh, Patricia Clarkson. That's oh, the she's man so who's great. Head of um, sag -Aftra. So it was a really great thing because, you know, it was, our, it was my union, sag -Aftra, and celebrating this mi uh, milestone in, you know, in, in social history. And it was just so lovely. And I feel that the spirit of, of, of Club Coming is very much 
sort of sense of community and things that I want to have there that people feel they can go and have fun and meet all people they would not normally meet, but also it's frolicky and sexy. That's very much the spirit that I sort of took from Stonewall and, and those those bars that were a, 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 a sense of community for people in those days too. We hear you get behind the bar, but maybe you don't know how to make all the drinks. Is that the case? That's absolutely correct. <laughs> when I, I, uh, I love being a bartender, but if I, if someone asks for a too complicated a drink, I try and dissuade them. <laughs> like, what's, yeah, what's the go-to? What's your, your, your Well, I love your... a vodka soda. That's very oh, that's easy. Yeah, that's right? mine yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It's easy and it's delicious. And uh, but I once I sometimes get confused with the C for Coke and the C for cranberry. Ah, uh, okay. And it's a bit dark. And I put I once gave someone a a, a Jack Daniels and cranberry. Oof, yeah. not so good. <laughs> you always have a lot of your famous friends show up. Do they give you a heads up? I know when I went, it was like the day before Emma Stone just randomly showed up. Uh, it's so cool. Did they always tell you, hey, I'm gonna come? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes they do. Like that one, yeah. Some people pop. You know, sometimes they pop over or sometimes they alert us they're coming. But sometimes they don't. You know, it is people. It was a hilarious time where. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence and, and Adele came. They, they did tell us they were coming, actually. But then they went downstairs. It was on a Saturday night, and they, they went downstairs into the basement. And, um, uh, uh, and, and Jennifer got her, you know, was getting her makeup done by the drag queen. <gasps> oh, that's awesome! <laughs> and then she peed in a in a in a bucket. <gasps> oh, Wait, whoa! Secrets Jennifer revealed. Jennifer Lawrence peed in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to go all the way upstairs. The well, yeah. Why? You don't want to make that walk wow. when you're down there already, and there's a bucket. <laughs> like, why and, not? And Adele's got, yeah, she's the face of Chanel. <laughs> like that. That's just, Peeing in a bucket. Being painted by a drag queen. That might be the best plug ever yeah. for your bar, is that, that kind of thing's going on, yeah. right? You never know what's going to happen, especially yeah, in the basement. Yeah. Um, all right, we're going to keep the fun going here. A little round of rapid fire questions. You ready for this? Yes. Um, here it is. You know it's going to be hot. Look at that graphic. Ooh. Starting with all the hard hitting questions here. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? I don't eat ice cream because I'm vegan. No yeah. ice cream. Yeah. All right. But I would cream. have, there's vegan, yeah, delicious. But I would have that salty, sea, salty caramel one. You know the one? Mm, that was good. This got a little bit of savory, a little mm -hmm. bit sweet. Biggest pet peeve? Oh, I would say um, my biggest pet peeve is when people get my name wrong, when they call me Cummings. Oh, right, that mm. drives me nuts. Yeah. All right, go to cocktail. I guess that's the vodka soda, right? Vodka soda yeah. or the vodka Easy. martini. Oh, okay. Straight up with a twist, incredibly dry. In fact, so dry, I just want no vermouth. I want just vodka. <laughs> just Ooh, there we go. Just right just big, straight vodka. Big black <laughs> and a iced vodka. Yeah. Morning person or night owl? <laughs> night owl. Yeah. Definitely, I'm not good in the morning. Mm. So th thank goodness that we're recording this at 3 a.m. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Ideal date night? Um, it would be like at home, I would cook and uh, you know, I'd have just, it would be inside away from everybody and uh, you know, watching something that I really want to watch on TV and have, ending with vigorous sexual relations. There you go, okay. <laughs> very specific and it sounds like a great night. Funniest cast member on Instinct? Um, Funniest, I go, I suppose, well, Bayana's hilarious. She's hilarious, she's mad as cheese. I mean, she's just nuts. And I really love her, like, she's, she's always doing silly things. Mm -hmm. Most embarrassing moment as an actor? Oh God, there's so many of them. Um, well, uh, like some of, some of my performances in films are so dreadful that I, <laughs> I'm embarrassed by them. Is there one that you think of, that particular you don't want to go back to? Um, well, there's one where I played a, a Minnesotan farmer. The film's really good. But I just think, I, the further I get away from it, I think, God, I wasn't very good in that, was I? <laughs> so, <laughs> like distance makes it worse. Yes. The further you yes, go. Yes. <laughs> Your partner's most annoying habit? Um, uh, not being able to leave uh, when I leave. Not being able to leave the house, having to do all these. Like on time, you mean? Like, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm ready to go, let's go. But you said we're ready to go, but then you've got to go and check doors and do all that ah. stuff and make dogs water and da da da, you know. And, Mm -hmm. Unplug things. You're like, let's just go. I'm just like, come on. <laughs> I, I, I go, I go out, and I get in a cab and try and shame him. In fact, the cab's waiting. <laughs> They're gonna leave. All right, last here. one. This is very important. Crunchy or creamy peanut butter? <laughs> um, I don't know. What would Kim Kardashian do? <laughs> <laughs> Can I take a call? I, <laughs> you phone a friend. I feel like she's a crunchy girl, right? I'm, I would go for crunchy. Yeah, I don't really yeah. eat peanut butter, but I like crunchy. It's like when you have orange juice. I love the pulp. Mm, I love when people can't stand texture. pulp. Yeah, it's like yeah. just it's oranges for goodness sakes, you know. Agree to disagree. Yeah. So I like a bit. I like um, I like uh, something to bite into. All right, I'm now glad we found out the important yeah. things here. Alan, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much <laughs> for stopping by. Pulse. Congrats on everything. Thank you. Guys, be sure to catch InSync when season two premieres June 30th on CBS. All right, last call for rescue dog parents. Submissions for People's World's Cutest Rescue Dog Contest presented by Pedigree are coming to a close, but there is still time to submit your pup and win. So all you have to do is upload a photo of your dog and tell us how adopting them has changed your life and theirs. 
Dogs of all shapes, sizes, and ages are welcome. Yes, and the pool of contenders will be narrowed down by readers. Then one lucky winner will be chosen by People Pedigree and celebrity judges Katherine Schwarzenegger and Dan from Dan and Shay. Last year's winner was Penny, a one-eyed golden retriever who was saved from the streets of Turkey by Kyra's rescue and was then adopted by a loving family in Silver Spring, Maryland. Look at that adorable She's pig. She's so cute. The stakes are high here, guys. The winner will receive a custom People photo shoot, a feature story in People magazine and on People.com, a one year supply of pedigree dog food and a $1,000 donation to the pet rescue organization of their choice. Pretty great prizes there. To submit, visit people.com slash cutest rescue dog. Submissions are still open until Sunday, June 30th, so get your pup in the running. The winner will be announced in September live on NBC's Today with Hoda and Jenna. We are about to discuss that moment and so many more from this week's season finale of The Real Housewives of New York City, plus The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Go from Provence all the way back to 90210. And here today, on everything from the chic to the bleak within The Real Housewives world are People's Housewives experts, People writer and reporter Dave Quinn, and People TV producer Sam Belikoff. Great What's to see up, you guys. Hey. All right, let's start with this, Dave. Hey, the hot mic. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, the hot mic moment from Barbara, we just saw definitely a top moment of the night. What was your reaction? as you watched it. My biggest reaction was, has Barbara learned nothing, okay? Before she joined the Real Housewives of New York City as a friend of the Housewives, she was in the background in another season where she talked about Luann behind her back and was caught in a hot mic moment. She was saying that it's not, you know, she didn't want Luann to get married. She thought it was a bad idea, and it was a huge controversy. She ended up trying to sue Bravo to, to stop them from airing the clip. Turned and, into a huge thing. Yeah, it turned into a huge thing. So have you learned nothing? Barbara, <laughs> come on, girl. Don't badmouth the countess. You have a uh, mic. Mike on at all yeah. times. Sam, what did you think of it? Well, to quote another famous singer, oops, she did it again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like Dave said, I can't believe that it happened twice. And it's sort of like when somebody does something and you kind of enjoy them for it, it kind of fits a sweet spot when they do it again. So it was fun to watch. Probably not yeah. fun for Luann, but like Luann said, you know, this is the Countess speaking, not the Countess singing. So, you know, exactly. it's, it's a fun show. Yeah. Another top <laughs> moment was when the ladies accused Tinsley of still being together with her ex-boyfriend, Scott. So take a look at this. I am not hiding anything. No, you're still involved with Scott. She says she this not. is ridiculous. I am not together with Scott. No, what I'm about happened. the Zimmerman $10,000 dresses and the $10,000 bags? Who's buying those? Because if hey, I from where? Are you joking me right now? I couldn't buy those. Well, well I'm sorry. I don't have a kid. Maybe that's where I put my money into. My, oh, my clothes honey, or my child. You would have to make a hell be buying those kind of dresses. Yeah, I'm not dating Scott. Hey, we're not talking about Scott anymore. I am not dating Scott. I actually still do dating, love him. But there's, there's no arrangement. There's no arrangement. Woo, Sam, what was your reaction <laughs> watching this scene? I mean, these women are so in each other's businesses, but like, would we have it any other way? I mean, what else would the Real Housewives franchise be without that? It was so fun to watch. I mean, the thing is, it's so wild of these ladies to come for Tinsley and think that she's not dating, that she's still dating Scott because she has a lot of money. Tinsley said in the after show, uh, the digital after show, like, basically, she didn't say in these words, but basically, like, do you know who I am? Like, I used to be a socialite. Like, it's not like Scott made me. Like, I have family money. Like, it's crazy. I don't know why they're coming on this particular thing. Yeah, they're really obsessed with it. Dave, yeah. why do you think all the women didn't believe Tinsley? What do you make of it all? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Tinsley is so protected. You know, she was, as she says, a socialite and really well known. She had that horrible fall for Grace, fall from Grace when she was arrested. And I think ever since then, her entryway back onto reality TV and into the social life has been very guarded. So I think because she puts up so many barriers and she tries to protect herself and not you know, let loose, the women have more questions. Yeah. Whereas if she was really open and free and said like, you know, this was expensive, but thank God mom paid for it. You know, like yeah, it would be right. a little bit better for her. All right, so another highlight came when many of the ladies visited Luann backstage before her cabaret. Luann wasn't exactly receptive, watch. Anyway, Mary, um, I'm just gonna sit here while you girls, we just have to finish my hair. Yeah. Really quick, I have to go on stage in 10 minutes. Girls. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, you look good, you can go on stage right now. 
Those people don't realize. They have no idea. What's that? I have no idea. I know, I know. I'm not dressed, my makeup's not done, and I have to be mentally prepared. Even at an elementary school play, the parents are not backstage 10 minutes before it's time to go on. So they need to get the f out. I honestly get it. Like, no. she needed to get in the zone if before the show. If you're a performer right. and it's 10 minutes before the show. Like, clear out, let her get in the headspace. Yeah. Sam, what did you think about Luann kind of kicking him out? Well, here's the thing. That woman sitting next to Dorinda is literally Luann's mother. So her whole excuse of not having your parent, even your parents backstage is so wild. I mean, her mother was there, her daughter, her son, her probably her pastor, her co third cousin. I mean, she had so <laughs> many people back there, those ladies, that she, like, requested come to the show even though they couldn't see it. The fact that she kicked them out is actually insane. That's my my opinion. Uh oh, Dave. I was uh -oh. there. <laughs> you were yeah, there. I knew that yeah, yeah I was there that night. We uh, we did a whole thing at People.com about it, and um, I did not go backstage beforehand because of that very reason. You know how crazy it gets with performers, mm -hmm. but it's not very big. I went backstage afterwards. It's small really space. small. Yeah, and I think the women. There was a lot of buzz about the fact that they were there and not staying. So mm -hmm. everybody in the auditorium was talking about it because you saw them come in and then you didn't. Didn't see them stay for the show at all. Interesting. But I get it. I, I side with Luann here. You're trying oh, to get yeah, your I show done. <laughs> get away from me. Yeah. All right, Bethany's holiday party took up the whole second half of the episode. Had so many fun, small moments. Dave, what stood out to you as a favorite? Well, there was this amazing moment where one of the strippers picked Bethany up while she was like sitting in a chair and like turned her upside down. <laughs> and meanwhile, like two days earlier, she had had this horrible reaction to uh, her fish allergy and nearly died. And it it was almost like she was gonna die again right then and there. I, that moment really made me laugh because you don't often see Bethany shaken up. She's pretty much always in control and it was like she was not in control mm -hmm. of that situation and her reaction was hilarious. Yeah, Sam, what stood out to you? You know, I have to say, I've actually been to, Amy was, is Bethany's party planner, I've been to a wedding that she's planned, wow. and her events are so luxe and chic that like it was just more of that in this one. I mean, right here, this is a moment that stood out to me. Basically, Bethany calling Luann insufferable to her face, but still <laughs> hugging it out. I mean, these women, they just really love each other despite kind of hating each other. Also, it was so vulgar. I mean, right now they're hitting a pinata for sex toys. I'd say the number <laughs> one thing was like Dave mentioned the strippers. That was the <laughs> end credit to the season. Like, yeah. I Iconic freeze frames on them groping strippers. I mean, I can't. But so I can't. it was it was over the top for sure. Dave, there was also a moment of closure for Bethany with yeah. Dennis that she spoke about. What was your reaction watching that? Well, that was very touching. You know, all season long, Bethany has been opening up about the death of Dennis and how it's impacted her. And here she really talked about how she felt like she was finally ready to move on. That he had kind of pulled her back when she was having that terrible allergy and said, I've got you, move forward, you know? And she yeah. now really feels like she's at a point where she's ready to move into this new relationship and kind of leave him in the past while still carrying the amazing memories that they had together. So it was really touching. And honestly, this is why Bethany's an all-star. She brings it every yeah. time. Yeah. But I'm begging, begging Bravo if they're watching, do not change this cast. Everybody is so perfect. It is a well-oiled machine. And this episode, this finale, this entire season really just fired on all cylinders. Keep nice that Bethany had that moment too. All right, let's yeah. move on to the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. The top moment of the night for this week's episode came at the end when Camille attacked Dorit and her husband, Pete. Kate's finances. Take a look. Don't you, you know, dare Mom, threaten me, sweetheart. I'm not Let me tell you something. I want, I'm protecting you. I'm protecting you. You're protecting you right me? Oh, You're yes. a little snake. That's no, what you are. I'm protecting you. It seems like there's things that maybe. PK hasn't been so open about in their financial situation. You want to you um, go low? To we'll protect. go low. I'm Camille, trying you... to protect oh, you. Yeah. Oh, Camille. I don't want to say something because maybe she doesn't know what's going on. Maybe her husband's not telling her everything. Honestly, do you call me I don't even want to hear it right now. I know your I husband owes over a million dollars to a company. Don't say anything else. Ooh, wow, Sam, what was your reaction to that? I mean, it makes you forget about Puppygate, doesn't it? I mean, that <laughs> was something to watch. Here's the thing, Camille thinks that she is being provoked, but she's still not protecting Dorit. To go say over and over again, I'm protecting you, I'm protecting you, while actually exposing to the other women and the world all of these things that, you know, I know what people want to know. Like, it's not the best. That's why all those other women kind of wanted to shut it down. I mean, 
it's something that like I understand why she said it because she kind of wants everything out on the table but don't pretend that you're protecting her kind of just go full throttle that's my yeah. take on that the other top moment of the night came earlier in Provence when Teddy apologized to Erica after her drunken night let's take a look and then sometimes when we're in the group and I f start to feel the disconnection or you seem like irritated, I think then I take it on and feel, it makes me feel almost uncomfortable. Teddy, are you apologizing to me or are you blaming me for your behavior? I'm a little confused here. That I, person I, that I saw last night, I was a little like, who is this Teddy? At the end of the day, I wasn't the one that was drunk and said a bunch of shit about someone else. You were. This Teddy was honestly drunk and stupid. But and you know I, who tells the truth? Drunks and children. <laughs> Boom. All right, real quick, what's your take on this, Sam? I think that she was apologizing to her. I don't think she was blaming her for her behavior, but I think Teddy can't help but say every thought that's going through her mind. Um, it was nice to see them come back together. And then just one little note, just unrelated to this episode, the um, chateau that they're staying in is most likely, according to social media, the chateau that Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner are getting married at this Ooh. weekend. Ooh. Oh, tidbits. Their second yeah. wedding. Yeah. We'll be looking for pics from that. Hey, but, uh, yeah. we're out of time. Sam, Dave, thank you so much for being here. Thanks thank for all you. the info. Everybody, make sure to follow along with us and watch all the Real Housewives. Potomac is back this Sunday, 8 p.m. And in two weeks, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills will be back for its finale, Tuesday at 9. And the Real Housewives of New York City will be back for part one of its reunion Thursday at 9, all on Bravo. All right, coming up next week, we will be joined live by O.T. Fagbenle, who plays Luke in The Handmaid's Tale. Plus, we're catching up with the cast of Spider-Man Far From Home. We've got Tom Holland, Zendaya, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Samuel L. Jackson. Thanks for watching. For now, we leave you with one last thing from Kim Raver. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys. Hi, I'm Kim Raver, and this is One Last Thing. The last song I jammed out to, You Need to Calm Down. I love it because it's great and also it's Pride Month. My last hangout with a Grey's castmate, Katerina and I and our husbands, we got to hang out at her house right after we wrapped. It was fantastic. Had a few cocktails and just hung out. The last show I binge watched, uh, Killing Eve, Sandra O. Oh. oh my God, so amazing. Your fancy hairpin is all over the place. Don't worry, I got another one. Thank you.